Good morning. Welcome to uh, panel uh, 4301, Nuclear Arms in Unstable Places. My name is Catherine Hazuri. I'm your moderator. And our speakers today are Valerie Plain, uh, who used to work for the CIA and was very Im involved in preventing nuclear proliferation, especially with Iran. Uh, and also, she is now working with organizations to continue, not just with Iran, but with other areas as well. Our, net, our other speaker, I'm sure you know as well, and his name is Joe Ciricioni, and he is uh, president of Plowshares, which is a, an organization uh, that is involved in also stopping nuclear proliferation. What we're going to do today is we're going to let them chat. And as after they chat, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Now, when we go to questions, I'm going to be a pretty hard stickler on questions, not statements but questions, and, and not even statements to get to your question, all right? You get to your question or you, don't, or you sit down, okay? We only have 50 minutes and this is a very important topic and I know that so many of you want to hear the answers to those questions. Also, students have priority on questions. So if you're a student and you're behind some old fogey like me, you just say, excuse me, ma'am or sir, I need to be in the front of the line, okay? All right, so I'm gonna turn it over now to our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you and good morning. I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that none of you woke up this morning thinking about nuclear weapons. And, and why should you? We've all got multiple challenges in our personal lives, our family, our community, our conference. We've got issues. But of all the challenges we face, there are only two that threaten us at a planetary scale, and that's global warming and nuclear weapons. Both of those are caused by machines that we invented and both of them threaten to destroy everything else we've invented, including human civilization. But both of these are preventable, reversible. But to do so, both of these require new ways of thinking and new political leaders with the courage to act. Both Valerie and I have been working on the issue of nuclear weapons for most of our professional careers. I started on the House Armed Services Committee staff during the height of the Cold War in the Reagan era. I then directed several projects at various Washington think tanks, wrote books, lectured around the world, and now run an organization called Plowshares Fund. We raise money from generous donors, and then we go find the smartest people with the best ideas of how to reduce those nuclear threats. So if you either have money or need money, please see me after this talk. <laughs> or you can go to our website, plowshares.org, spelled the English way, P-L-O-U-G-H. My story is fairly traditional. A lot of people in Washington have done what I've done. Valerie's, Valerie's is really interesting. So why don't you tell us yours? Good morning, thank you, Joe, thank you, Kathy. It's a delight to be back Mackey Auditorium, beautiful venue, and an honor to be here with Joe, who uh, is unparalleled in being able to explain a, co a complicated and intimidating issue in ways that you go, ah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Joe's absolutely right. You didn't wake up thinking this morning uh, about nuclear weapons. It's something that really, since the Cold War, and, and in the earlier part of the Cold War, when school children were taught how to do duck and cover, as, as though that would help from nuclear annihilation, um, after the Cold War, 
it was a topic that sort of got swept under the carpet. Oh, thank goodness we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, when in fact, the truth is the threat has continued to grow. I just wanna say one word about the school children of which I see a lot of students in the audience today. And that makes, yes, and they're waving. I'm thrilled <laughs> because this is not a topic that you learn about in school very often. It's not on your curriculum. You might hear about the end of Second World War being brought to a close faster because we dropped bombs on Hiroshima, maybe. Um, but that's really about it. So I'm, del I'm so happy to see you here today. Hopefully you take away a couple things and will spark your interest and look more. So very briefly, how I came to this issue, and it's something I care about passionately, I joined the CIA, I was a covert operations officer. My expertise was developed in nuclear nonproliferation, which essentially means making sure the bad guys, whether they are terrorists or rogue nation states or sundry other characters, do not get a nuclear capability. As I said just a moment ago, the threat has increased even as our awareness of it has diminished. And by that I mean, uh, Nuclear technology is much more widely spread. And of course, we have seen in ways that are absolutely horrifying the rise of terrorism. Uh, the, the latest that we have seen are talking about is ISIS. They are clearly a nihilistic group. And can you imagine what they would do if they acquired any sort of nuclear capability? When I worked at the CIA, as I said, I tried to make sure bad guys don't get nuclear weapons, and what that meant was I was recruiting and running assets to make sure, looking at the procurement networks, how did terrorists or rogue states get all the widgets that they need for nuclear infrastructure, um, how to delay it, deter it, shut it down altogether, uh, and I loved what I did. I was very proud to serve my country and felt that every once in a while something that I did was worthwhile. Uh, but I left the CIA in 2007 <laughs> under circumstances that were uh, quite, a, uh, quite a shock to me. Uh, there was the leak of my name, but that's a story for another time. Um, but I left in 2007 and uh, wondered, okay, now what? How do I, you know, <laughs> my resume is kind of odd. What do I do now? Uh, we moved from Washington, D.C. to where we are now, New Mexico. And I got a phone call out of a blue, out of the blue, uh, in 2010, 2009 actually, from a Hollywood producer. Uh, and he was making a documentary with others uh, called Countdown to Zero. He had been involved in that film, Inconvenient Truth, uh, about global warming, and he wanted to capture that same excitement in this documentary, Countdown to Zero, excitement and concern and action that I think kicked off the whole issue of global warming. He wanted to do that for the power and the threat of nuclear weapons. Uh, you can get it on Netflix, Amazon, whatever. Take a look at it. It's, st it's still extremely relevant. It Came is. Out it's a very good film. 2010. Excellent production values. And you, what's really capturing about it is that you see world leaders from Gorbachev to Tony Blair to Musharraf of Pakistan to Jimmy Baker, our former Secretary of State, uh, uh, talking about, you know, these were, they were involved very closely in these decisions of, uh, of nuclear war or not. And to a person, they said, we have just gotten lucky. So far, we've just gotten lucky. Uh, the, through the Cold War, it was used as a deterrent, but where we are now, it's uh, much more dangerous. We need to pay attention. It is a topic that I think doesn't easily invite your participation as a citizen, as a citizen of the world. You know, what can I do? Good heavens, these are talks that are among political leaders and it tends to be very elitist in its uh, approach. Uh, and they tend to use a lot of jargon that, like any profession, it tends to keep out, 
outsiders out and, and keep the insiders in the know. And so there are several places we can talk about later of where other spaces for real people to become engaged and become involved. But I'll stop there and we'll go on to... So let's start with one place. 90% of all the stories in U.S. papers about nuclear threats are about Iran. I don't believe that is the most serious threat we face. I think that's Pakistan. We'll get to that later. But Iran captures the American media and public and political attention because of its geopolitical location, its nearness to some of our key allies, and the stakes that are involved in stopping Iran from getting a nuclear bomb. This is a problem that has vexed uh, two administrations. When George W. Bush took office, there were no centrifuges spinning in Iran. His policy was to confront Iran, to try to coerce Iran into stopping its program. By the time he left, there were 6,000 machines, and Iran was off to the races. There are now 20,000 machines there today. These are the machines that spin uranium gas to purify the gas so that it can be used for fuel, which Iran says it's doing, or for weapons. And the question is, do you trust Iran? Do you believe that this is purely a peaceful program? Clearly, we do not. So the efforts over the last decade, and particularly over the last 18 months, when we, uh, we arrived at an initial agreement with Iran that froze its program and rolled it back in key respects, is to find, try to find a deal that could stop Iran's program from ever being used for a bomb. Ideally, you would want zero. You would want to take all those machines out, level the entire infrastructure. But we are not Rome, and Iran is not Carthage. We cannot salt the nuclear earth there. They have the knowledge of how to build a bomb. You cannot sanction or, or bomb that away. So the trick was to find a compromise. What would allow Iran to keep enough of its nuclear facilities so that they could make fuel for some of their reactors, research reactors, but limit it in such a way that it wouldn't threaten us or Iran's neighbors? That was the deal that was just struck in Switzerland on Thursday. It is a remarkable achievement. It is stunning in its breadth and in its depth. It caught, caught all of us by surprise. So there's a reason you're seeing national security leaders line up in support of this agreement. I was honored to join a letter on Monday signed by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, Big New Brzezinski, Brent Scowcroft, Carla Hills, Admiral Fallon, General Zinni, and many, many others, saying, give this deal a chance. Don't do anything in Congress to hurt the negotiations as we finalize this deal over the next 90 days. We just need the do-nothing Congress to do nothing. <laughs> 90 days. Just give us 90 days to finish the deal. If, if there, there were many, many articles about it. I wrote one in Huffington Post just the beginning of this week or you know, over the weekend. You can Google it, search it, about why this deal is in our national uh, security interest. The, this, but just briefly, it cuts Iran's inventory of centrifuges by two-thirds, leaves them some, but only the oldest machines, the 1970s machines that they got from your friend, A.Q. Khan in Pakistan. Buddies, buddies. AQ, <laughs> and, and, and it cuts their supply of gas, so the stuff they would feed into the centrifuges. So that means that even if they broke out of this agreement, it would take them at least a year to make the material for a bomb. It also eliminates their, the, the, the plutonium production reactor that they were building, so that it cuts off the plutonium path, and finally it puts in place a verification regime that gives us the tools we would need to catch Iran should it cheat, and here's the last best part, it keeps together the global coalition of the world powers who have put the sanctions on Iran, that forced Iran to come to the bargaining table. So if we catch them, if they cheat, you could snap those sanctions back on. And this is very important to remember, this is a global arrangement. It's not the U.S. versus Iran, it's the P5, the permanent five members of the U.N. Security Council plus Germany striking this deal. It is a remarkable 
historical achievement. It's good for the U.S., it's good for Israel, it's good for the world. But Joe, let me, I think it would be helpful because what we have also heard in equally loud, if not louder voices, is why this is the worst deal ever. It's a providing an autobahn, as I heard yesterday, for Iran to get a nuclear bomb, uh, that uh, we didn't squeeze enough concessions out of them, they can still get a nuclear weapon in 10 to 15 years' time, um, and Israel continues to feel extremely threatened by this, that their behavior has not changed, they have lied, cheated, they're not, they're, they're true enough, uh, the Iran's record on staying true to their world word is somewhat spotty. So can you address some of those, some of the loudest criticisms and concerns? Sure, there are three levels of criticism on this deal. And one is the genuine concern about the terms. Because this is not a signed deal yet, it's just a framework. It all still has to be worked out, and some of it's still vague. You know, it's like the kind of arrangement you'd be negotiating with the bank or, or with labor and management. You know, you've agreed on most of it, but some of it is open to interpretation, so there's concerns, and that's healthy. You want the experts questioning this. You want the press questioning this. The second le letter level is more pernicious, and that's the political level. A lot of President Obama's political opponents don't want a Democratic president to have a success of any kind in any area. If this man presented Congress with a cure for cancer, they would reject it. I am not kidding. It is that level of political opposition, if you, you know what I'm talking about. It's at heights we've never seen in, in, in America in a very, very, very long time. Uh, and so you see the Republican opposition in the Senate almost to a person uniting against the deal. The third is ideological, and this is actually the more insidious. These are the people who promoted the war in Iraq. When Iraq came to the United States in 2003, when they had a couple of dozen centrifuges, and they offered a comprehensive deal to talk about their program, their relations with Israel, their relations with Saudi Arabia, their support for Hamas and Hezbollah, even human rights, the Bush administration rejected it. In the words of Dick Cheney, we don't negotiate with evil, we defeat it. When John Bolton was asked what lesson other countries, Iran and North Korea, should draw from the Iraq war, he said, take a number. And that was the idea, that was the Bush doctrine. We're just gonna roll over using military force as the major instrument of statecraft. We're gonna force regime change. We're gonna coerce other nations to do what we want. Well, if you get a chance, I hope this week you will go to the New York Times website and look at the interview President Obama gave to Tom Friedman. Because it's, a, it's a, a written interview, but it's also a, a video. Watch it. Because then you see President Obama articulate what some call the Obama Doctrine, and it's based on engagement. That the way we solve our national security problems is to engage with the world, even our adversaries. Like Reagan did with this evil empire. Like Nixon did with Mao. You engage, and in so doing, that's how you get the, cha the, the, the change you need. That's how you build the security you need. So right now, you're seeing the clash of the Obama doctrine and the Bush doctrine. This, Obama's trying to get this deal through Congress, and the same people who tricked us into an unnecessary war in Iraq are trying to trick us into an unnecessary war with Iran. You think I'm kidding? Go read John Bolton's op-ed, <laughs> Bomb Iran. Go listen to John McCain on the floor of the Senate. He hopes Israel goes rogue. Go listen to the newest boy crush the neocons have, Tom Cotton. Yeah. Go listen to Tom Cotton. He's promised yesterday that a war with Iran would be quick, cheap, and easy. <laughs> Valerie, where have we heard that before? Yes. Uh, this, let me add something that may seem initially a little off, but I will bring it back to Joe's point. So recently, a few days ago, the former New York Times journalist Judith Miller released a memoir. You might remember Judith Miller. She spent 85 days in jail because she refused to reveal her sources in the leak of my name, which ultimately led to the conviction of Scooter Libby, Vice President Cheney's chief of staff. So there's a lot coming out. She's revisiting this period. And what this is bringing up again, it's allowing those that took us to war in Iraq to continue to make another attempt at rewriting history. Exactly what Joe was saying. We were told that Iraq would be a cakewalk, 
that was Ken Edelman, that, uh, that the oil of Iraq would in fact pay for this very swift, fast regime change. Um, and really don't worry about it, we got it all under control, trust us. We are hearing those, <laughs> we're hearing those same voices again regarding Iran. They think that this deal is so bad and when pressed, when pressed, well, what's your idea? What's your option? They finally have to say, well, uh, war, war. That's, uh, when if, it's true that there is some division within the Pentagon, as there always is on any given subject, but the overwhelming consensus in the Pentagon is war with Iran is unwinnable. And furthermore, it would only, if we manage to bomb uh, their underground facilities, nuclear facilities, and in the course, you know, there's the collateral damage of tens of thousands of civilian lives lost. Uh, the only way, it would, the only amount it would really delay their nuclear program, what are they saying, two to three years? Two to three years, Secretary Gates, uh, yeah. Secretary Panetta, two to three year delay, after which they'd be off to the races. They would go all out to build a bomb, which they're not currently doing. So I'm saying especially to the younger people in this audience, use your critical thinking skills. Be, think carefully when you hear those that are out there saying that this is the worst deal ever and really the only other option is war to completely wipe this menace of Iran and its really nasty regime from the face of the earth. Uh, do look at your history. Use your critical thinking skills. For, for you students, this is a great time to be paying attention to this issue. Nobody really cares what you think. So, okay, your mothers, your fathers, <laughs> maybe your parents, but you can learn from this. Watch this. It's not very often that you get to watch the hinge of history move, and we may be at such a moment. If we can solve this problem, we are not only ending one of the greatest nuclear threats that most many people feel we face, but we may be stopping the wave of proliferation that began with the bombing at Hiroshima, where, where countries started to develop programs to get the bomb. We often talk about countries like Iran and North Korea, but the truth is there are no countries like Iran and North Korea. There's only Iran and North Korea. There are no other countries with nuclear programs at this scale on the edge of nuclear weapons capability. North Korea has already passed it. Iran is on the edge. If you can roll back Iran's program, freeze it, lock it up for at least 15 years, maybe longer, you could be looking at the end of proliferation. That's a truly historic event. And if you can do that, you may be opening the gate to other issues that the U.S. and Iran can discuss. We're never going to be BFFs with Iran. <laughs> but we have a lot of strategic objectives in common. We have a lot of concerns in the neighborhood that we share, like defeating ISIS, stabilizing Iraq, stabilizing Afghanistan, ending the conflict in Syria. And what you want to do if you're a great power is you want to have relations with all the countries in the region, we do not currently with Iran, mm -hmm. so that you can work out collective solutions. So this could be the beginning of a fundamental transformation of the geopolitics of the region, something many presidents have tried to do, and none until now has been able to do it. And for those of you who are not students, and you're wondering, okay, what can I do about this? Talk to your senator. Talk to Senator Bennett. Senator Bennett is a fine man. I'm sure many of you support him, maybe have contributed to him. He is one of the few Democratic co-sponsors of a bill by Senator Corker, Republican from Tennessee, now the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The Corker bill is gonna go up for discussion in the committee next week. The Corker bill would kill the Iran deal. The Corker bill would impose conditions on the deal that would effectively kill it. It would bring the deal to the Congress for an up or down vote. This is not a treaty. It is not required to go to the Congress. It's an executive agreement. Most executive decisions, most national security decisions are made in just this way, executive agreements. Ronald Reagan made 1,500 executive agreements. The deal that the president just made with China on climate change, executive agreement. The deal he's making with Cuba to, Cuba to open up diplomatic relations, executive agreement. This is an executive agreement, a multilateral agreement. If you force this to go to Congress for an up or down vote, is there anybody in this room that think Congress is gonna approve this deal by a, a majority. 
it is a deal killer under the guise of involving Congress. There are plenty of ways that Congress can be involved. Please share your thoughts with Senator Bennett. If you're like me, I told my Senator Ben Cardin, to, all I want is to give it 90 days. Don't take any congressional action for 90 days. Give diplomacy a chance to work. Your voices matter. Your letters matter, your emails matter. I know, I worked in Congress for 10 years. Members count. One call matters, two matter more, a hundred matter a whole lot. If just everybody in this room called, you would matter a whole lot. Kathy, I know, is eager to go to questions, but b just quickly before we do that, <laughs> I think we should actually address the, the, the panel's title, which is, <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. Um, which is uh, nukes in unstable regimes. And let me toss something out and, I, I'll, and then hand it over to Joe. What does that mean? It, are unstable regimes only North Korea, only Iran, because they're so alien to us in so many ways? Let me propose to you that in fact, all regimes that hold a nuclear weapon are in inherently unstable. And what I mean by that is that France, which is a nuclear power, is not going to suddenly surprise the world by detonating a nuclear weapon somewhere sometime. What we both take that to mean is the inherent instability of the command and control structure, not to mention that the ones running it are humans. And that's right, we are all, our foibles and our, our um, difficulties in sometimes uh, just doing simple things, there's always failures. If anyone saw, there was a very good piece done by 60 Minutes last year, and it looked at the command and control structure of the United States Air Force. That's, it was absolutely horrifying. There was this big disconnect. On one hand, the nuclear weapons regime in the United States uh, is given a great deal of lip service, really, and prestige and money, and yet when you saw the 60 Minutes piece, it was very clear that the people who are usually these young officers just out of the academies, 22, 23, 24, uh, that are the, in the missile silos up in Montana or in Kansas, and how poor- Or in Colorado. Or in Colorado. You got 50 here. Um, how poor how poorly the infrastructure has been kept up. They're, they're making phone calls from the silos back to headquarters on black rotary dial phones, which is what my mother still has, but that's okay. Uh, she's not in charge of the nuclear arsenal. Um, and uh, j just the, the training, the morale, the problems in, uh, uh, they are obligated to take a monthly test the cheating was rampant. It was absolutely horrifying. So when we talk about unstable regimes, and I want Joe to talk a little bit more about this because yeah. this is important, let, let me make absolutely clear, it's not just those faraway places like Iran and North <laughs> Korea. The 60 Minutes piece was terrific, but by far the best was John Oliver. So when you go home, after you watch the President Obama speech, after you call Senator Bennett, after you donate to Plowshares Fund, then go Google John Oliver. Just Google Oliver Nuclear, John Oliver Nuclear. He did a fabulous spot on this uh, last summer detailing how the deputy commander of our strategic command was drunk in Moscow and tried to get on stage and play with the Beatles cover band at a Mexican restaurant, which has all kinds of levels of poor judgment. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> no, it was not karaoke. He just wanted to play. Uh, and was bragging about how powerful he was. Uh, another commander was arrested for g being at an Indian reservation casino and trying to use counterfeit chips. Uh, members of the Missile Command uh, Force in, uh, in Montana were, acute, were found to be cheating on their exams, and they discovered the cheating when they were investigating drug use among the... So, uh, we say this, because there are profound problems in the command and control system of our country that we know about. Imagine what's going on in Russia that we don't know about. There have been major accidents during the history of the Cold War where we came this close to accidentally annihilating the planet. 
including back in 1995, when the, the Soviet Union was over and it was Boris Yeltsin, and, Boris, and, the, and the, there was a mistake that they thought they were under attack, and for the first time in the history of the nuclear age, the military commanders brought the football, the box with the switches and command codes to Yeltsin and said, we're under attack, you've got to launch. Fortunately for us, Yeltsin wasn't drunk that day. He didn't believe the commanders, he waited, they got better information, they closed the suitcase, moved away. That's just one incident. There's dozens. So you gotta be a real optimist to think that you can keep 16,000 nuclear weapons in fallible human hands indefinitely and nothing bad is going to happen. The only way to prevent this is to reduce these weapons as quickly and as safely as we can and move towards the day where we can one day eliminate them. They are not protecting us, they are threatening us. Let's open it now to questions. There are... <clears throat> There are microphones uh, in both aisles. The students go first, okay? All right, let's take this question. Uh, hey, Joe, you mentioned that you think Pakistan is the biggest threat as having a nuke, and I was wondering if you could talk about that more. Pakistan is about, has enough, has about 120 nuclear weapons, and they have enough material for about 100 more. They're building nuclear weapons faster than any country on Earth. They have an unstable government presiding over a collapsing economy. They have strong Islamic fundamentalist influences in their military and intelligence apparatus. They share a border with the nuclear-armed India with whom they have waged four wars since independence. Oh, and they have Al-Qaeda operating inside their territory and six Al-Qaeda-like organizations also operating inside their and territory. And inside their intelligence apparatus, yeah. Really? I didn't know. No, I, I, she knows. Uh, so this, 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 this is a recipe for disaster. Every war game uh, we've ever done to model what an in, a next India-Pakistan war would look like goes nuclear, goes nuclear. So this is the, this for, for me, for, I think for us, do you agree with this? I think this is the, the real risk. I, I firmly believe that if we're going to see a nuclear weapon used in combat, it's most likely going to happen in South Asia. If a nuclear weapon is ever detonated by a terrorist in the United States, it's most likely going to come from the arsenal of Pakistan. I agree. Young man? Um, do you think North Korea can, like, sell its nukes to a rogue terrorist? Yes, I do. Uh, the North Korean regime is very bizarre, as you probably know. It is a cult masquerading as a state. When I was working at the CIA, a lot of times what some of the things we were looking at is all the nefarious activities that the North Korean state were, were doing, including prostitution, gambling, counterfeiting money, so they would bring in hard currency. And let me tell you, it wasn't to feed the people of North Korea. It was to build this program. Uh, so, in fact, uh, they are res the North Koreans are responsible for proliferating themselves, not uh, with uh, technology on the delivery systems, missiles. Uh, it is absolutely frightening because we really don't have a very good sense because it is truly the hermit kingdom for, uh, called that for good reason. Very hard to understand what is going on. And, uh, and the young leader is quite untested and it's, it appears that there's internal power strifes going on. And the whole scenario is absolutely, cat possibly catastrophic. Yeah, thank Over you. Here. So why would countries like Iran, Pakistan, Syria have any reason to launch a nuclear bomb? Say that one more time, why would they have what? Why would they have any reason to launch a nuclear bomb or a missile? Well, actually, they, they likely wouldn't. Uh, no country since we did it has actually used a nuclear weapon. So then why are we so scared about them doing it? Why let them keep all their centrifuges? I know. It could be a very, it's a potential risk, but it's not a very major one at this point. Uh, who are you? 
<laughs> He's a young neocon. <laughs> <laughs> no, that no, that's good. That's good. So this, so you, th this is actually a fundamental issue in in nuclear policy, and it's the question of deterrence. And so the theory basically goes that if someone has a nuclear weapon, you can deter them from using it by threatening equal or greater destruction upon them, and you are deterred. And in fact, deterrence theory more or less works. So Israel has about 100 nuclear weapons. So even if Iran had nuclear weapons, which they do not, uh, would they actually use them? If they launched a weapon on Israel, it would cause tremendous destruction, and it would be a completely suicidal act. And for a, a regime that is, whose number one goal is the preservation of the regime, well, that would pretty much end it. The only reason you think that deterrence theory doesn't work is, one, the country doesn't care about its future existence. So it's apocalyptic, that it doesn't, it doesn't matter to them what happens next. Uh, I don't know any regime like that. It's, uh, they're sometimes characterized that way, but there's very little evidence that any government is like that. And, and the second th th problem with the deterrence theory is that it works very well until it doesn't. And if for some reason somebody miscalculates or slips or makes a mistake, then deterrence theory ends with catastrophe. So w what we're trying to do in Iran is we don't even want to get into that realm. We want to be safe at many, many levels lower. We don't want Iran to have a bomb. We don't want to have them on the edge of making a bomb. We want the government of Iran to decide that they can satisfy their security, prestige, and regional concerns in a non-nuclear way, because that's the way you stop countries from getting bombs, when they themselves are convinced that they're better off without it. And I would just add that there's something to be said about an arms race. Iran gets it. And then all of a sudden, everyone else in the region is, you know, sitting up a little straighter in their chairs going, ooh, we need one too. One, there's this prestige factor. If you have a nuclear weapon, that means you're in the big boys club. But also, as we see, it, it is analogous uh, to, I know this is an issue, a big deal in Colorado, guns, right? Well, if, if those people have guns, I better take you know, conceal carry to church, or may maybe we need to arm all the teachers in the school, because that's how you keep safe. And that is analogous to what is happening with nuclear weapons. Well, if Iran has one, uh, then, you know, the other states around in, in the neighborhood are going, well, we really need to have one too. Over here. Um, what was the deal that we made with Iran? Or not we, but what was the deal with Iran? So it's called a, a framework for a comprehensive agreement. It was just released on Thursday, and it's the P5 plus one, so the United States, United Kingdom, France, Russia, and China, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, plus Germany. And the, together they agreed, and by the way, that's not easy to do on anything. So they agree, and that's why it took them so long, and that's why they were pulling all-nighters. Sometimes you stay up late to study. Imagine doing that five nights in a row. That's what they did at these negotiations. And it's an agreement where basically Iran will roll back its nuclear program, freeze it, lock it up, and put it under a microscope. And, and, w and w some of the provisions require them to stop all activities for 10 years, some for 15, some for 25, some, like the inspections and the ban on doing any work on nuclear weapons, those are like diamonds. They last forever. And this, and in exchange, we will slowly move the sanctions that we put on Iran off of them so they can start doing business with the rest of the world. They can start selling more of their oil, for example. And the reason this is important is because we believe this deal creates the incentives for Iran to honor the agreement. We're setting up inspections so that they cheat. We won't, but the core is that it's in Iran's interest to do that. I had dinner last year with President Rouhani of Iran, and when he came to the UN, it was a group of about 20, 25 Americans, including some former national security advisors and heads of foundations. And one of the things he said was that he believes that Iran over the next 30 years could become the 10th largest economic power in the world. A lot of experts would agree with him. And Rouhani represents that pragmatic wing of the Iranian elite that believes that their real power is economic, 
not the illusion of power that nuclear weapons promise. Thank you. Over here. Hi, so uh, my question is a little hypothetical, but obviously there's some uh, validity to the claim. What if uh, Iran makes, like, takes action to pursue uh, nuclear bombs? You didn't really discuss uh, what, ha what should the United States do if they make undeniable like, action towards that uh, result? So under this agreement, one of the inspection procedures we laid out is we're going to track Iran's program from the uranium coming out of the mines all the way through the, the process until it's stored as cylinders and gas. We have unprecedented access to the entire supply chain. So if they got a covert program someplace, well, they're gonna, it's going to have to be a completely parallel program with hidden mines and hidden centrifuge plants, which is extremely hard to do. You know, it's... I won't say impossible, but it's, and plus, of course, we have our own national intelligence assets. But let's say they do. And one of the things you want to do is you want to deter Iran from cheating. You want to make the costs very high and the benefits very low. The first thing you do, you, you would do is immediately the UN Security Council would meet and there would be new sanctions imposed, almost certainly. That you, and you could even get Russia and China to agree to that. But, and, and so that would be the first line to try to push them back. But if that failed, and if they persisted in this program, we then have military options. These are not attractive. These are not easy. It would almost certainly lead to a wider war, but you then would be in a position, like you are right now, to decide if you want to take military action, if that was the, the course that you preferred. So all of the options we have now would still be on the table if sometime in the future Iran violated this agreement. Thank you. So we, um, there's a lot of, America has had a lot of differences with a lot of countries such as um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran. Other than Pakistan and Iran, do you think there's any other country we should be worrying about for nuclear war or anything like that? I'll start by saying I am guessing that for all of your conscious life, you've only known the United States at war. We went into Afghanistan in 2002, 2000, excuse, 2001, right after, yeah, 2001. And it's been sort of one continuous war after another. And that's, that's hard for me to think of that. You're, th this is what you've known. Uh, this, when you finally are, you're watching TV with your folks or reading the paper, it's war, war, war. Your question, what other countries should we be worrying about in addition to Pakistan and Iran, uh, North Korea? But it is beyond just those countries, as I mentioned briefly before, uh, it's, it's the fact that if terrorists get a hold of a nuclear capability, even if it's a so-called dirty bomb, which is where you use conventional explosives and you use radioactive material, although there wouldn't be that many people killed, the fear that that would instill if, it, if something like that were to happen on, in a city in the United States would be, the ripple effect would be profound. So uh, that's where a lot of the worries are. Do you have other countries? Russia. Yeah. So Russia and the United States have 90 5% of the, all the nuclear weapons in the world. So if you're worried about nuclear weapons, you've got to worry about those two countries near the top of your list. And the way th the experts generally rank the risk, the number one risk is a terrorist use of a nuclear bomb. Even though it's hard for them to do, and, and the chances are low, the consequences would be enormous. The second is the spread of these weapons to other less stable countries. And the third is the existing stockpiles in the United States and Russia. So that's the way we generally look at the threats. Okay, thank you. We have about five minutes left, so we'll take the question from the smart young man who shifted from this long line <laughs> and came over to this shorter line that had no <laughs> students in front of it, okay? That's what so, I do in the grocery store. So we're going to do, we're gonna, and we're going to try and get this young woman's as well, okay? Go ahead. Okay, so... You're saying that any country that possesses like a nuclear weapon is unstable, but we have nuclear weapons 
but we have a like we have a stable government and all that. So are we like a threat to other countries? Yes, we are, and it's not because the government's unstable. I mean, the you know you're not worried about the. Pakistan government necessarily choosing to use a weapon. You're worried about things spiraling out of control in there. And the same in the U.S., it's our command and control system that is unstable. There's a, the best book written on nuclear weapons in the last 30 years is Eric Slosher's book, Command and Control. You may read know it. This, you, yeah, read it. It's the best. You may know this guy. He wrote a book called Fast Food Nation, and they made a movie out of it called Food Inc. Well, he, he's Command and Control, and he documents the, 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 the enormous number of accidents we've had with our own nuclear weapons. We accidentally dropped a hydrogen bomb on North Carolina, for example. Seven, there were seven safety switches, six of them failed. One thin wire prevented that bomb from going off. It's the reason we still have a North Carolina today. So yeah, the existence of these weapons in fallible human hands is a risk to ourselves and to other nations. Eric totally owes us 10% in royalties, <laughs> but... It is, his writing is so fluid, so beautiful. He's telling a story, uh, but it, <laughs> it is so also deeply researched. I highly recommend it. Okay, over here. Um, so since we're sort of making a pretty big, be pretty big deal about other countries having nuclear weapons, don't you think that uh, other countries are trying to stop us with our nuclear weapons as well? Well, uh, there's to several ways to answer that question. One, diplomatically. In, the in a couple of months, there's going to be a meeting at the UN, United Nations uh, to review the existing treaty on nonproliferation. And th that's where most of the countries of the world have signed this treaty. And most of the countries of the world have promised never to get nuclear weapons. And the countries that have signed the treaty and are members of the UN Security Council, the five, UK, France, Russia, China, Great Britain, we all have nuclear weapons and we're supposed to be reducing ours. So you do have other countries pushing us, opposing us to get rid of our nuclear weapons. It turns out that the other countries will challenge us in other ways. We have wars, we have conflicts with other countries. In all the conflicts we faced in the last 70 years, none have required us to actually use a nuclear weapon. I can't think of any military mission we have that requires the use of even one nuclear weapon uh, that hasn't for 70 years, even though we've lost wars, we've lost troops, we've lost allies. I could be wrong, so maybe we should keep 10, maybe 50. I'll give you 500. Let's keep 500 nuclear weapons. We have 5,000. And the budget for how to sustain and modernize that force over the next 30 years tops $1 trillion. That's not money that me and Valerie are going to be paying. We're going to be getting our checks from the government. That's the money you guys are going to be paying. So if you, wanna, you don't want to waste a trillion dollars on nuclear weapons over the next 30 years of your life, do something about it now. If I may just add, let me give you a quick list of things that nuclear weapons can't help us with. Shall we? Okay. ISIS? No, not so much. Uh, Ukraine? No, that's a mess, but nuclear weapons not useful there. Uh, let's see, Ebola? No. Uh, climate change? No. Um, I don't know. Justin Bieber? <laughs> Poverty? I don't know. You know, nu nuclear weapons are, are really useless, and they cost that much money, a billion dollars over the next, trillion, trillion with a T, over the next 30 years. Let me close. Oh, President Obama, in his, pre, his pre speech at Prague, where he laid out his, the nuclear vision, said that he knew that uh, a call to arms can stir the souls of men and women more than a call to lay them down. And that's why the voices of, of peace and progress have to be raised together. Valerie and I have raised our voices together today. We hope you will join us. Thank you very much. There is another panel that starts right after us, so we have to move out. Okay? Oh, that was great.